Morning, happy Sabbath. Thank you for that story. Yes, God does have the best plans. I made some plans this week, actually two weeks ago, to write a sermon. I scrapped that last night and rewrote the whole sermon. My plans were not going, going very good at all. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes with me and pray before I proceed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, I thank you for the time that I've had to study your word and um, to put a few words together. To... Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit speaks through me and that you be with those here in the congregation and that they may learn some of the things that you have revealed to us, Lord. Be with me now, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So yeah, I had planned, Revelation 10 is the sermon. I don't think, I don't have any slides, sorry. Um, I preached at the start of the year and I was very proud because it was the first time I had put a slideshow together. This time my computer wasn't playing with me. It, um, I need to wipe it and reset it up. So I've got back to old school, I've written hand notes. So you might have to open your Bible um, and study with me. But I had planned Revelation chapter 10. Most of you Adventists would probably have a good idea what Revelation 10 is about. Or got some thoughts on it. And I did. And I wrote my sermon. And I had dates. And I was from here to there. And I was going all over the Bible. But I wasn't convinced all week. It was too much. I think it was... I couldn't do Revelation chapter 10 justice. It's not something I think you can preach in a 30-minute sermon. So I focused on, I think if you've all got the journal, our memory verse this week. So Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. It says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh trump, uh, angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. I read through chapter 10, and you come to this verse and you could almost skip it. It seems like it's not meant to be in there. Revelation 10 is about the mighty angel, and he has a little book in his hand. And he comes to John and he tells John that John's to take the little book and he's to eat it. So chapter 10 seems to, uh, chapter, uh, verse 7, sorry, seems to be a little bit out of place. But we're going to try and understand what this verse is about. So my first question is, what is the mystery of God? And I think in the, in the journal... It said that the topic was the mystery of God would be revealed. But that's not what this verse says. The verse says that the mystery of God will be finished or would be finished. So my question, what is the mystery of God? So I've got a few verses for us to look up. And I'm going to read out of the um, NIV because they're a little bit simpler in that verse to un in that translation to understand. So the first one is Romans 16. It's verse 25 to 26. Romans 16, 25 and 26. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden, hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience of faith. Paul's telling us here 
that there was a mystery that was around before ages passed. Before the world began, there was a mystery of God. It was hidden, but it has now been revealed to us through Christ Jesus and through the scriptures. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Colossians 1, 26 and 27 says, The mystery that has been kept hidden from ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, the mystery that God hid before time began has now been revealed to us in Christ Jesus. And that mystery is that Christ can live inside of us. That's the hope we have, that Christ lives in us. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavishes upon us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when the times reached their fulfilment, to bring unity to all these things, sorry, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. The salvation of God, the salvation we find in Jesus Christ, that is the mystery of God. In the dictionary, the mystery or mystery is defined as something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. We are told in the scriptures that God has revealed this mystery to us. The mystery of God is his salvation. It is what Jesus has done for us, it is what Jesus is doing for us, and it is what Jesus will do. Uh, it is how Jesus is going to end sin. The Bible also calls sin a mystery. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. This is talking about, this is the angel comes and speaks to um, Mary. And the angel says to her, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. We know that Jesus paid the price for our sin. He suffered on the cross for us. But my question is, why, since the cross, does sin still exist? Why are we still living in a world full of sin if Jesus is the mystery of God and he came to save us from sin? Now this is a question that I'm sure most of you probably have been asked when you tell people that you're a Christian. It's often used by those that want to not believe or discredit God. You think you're a Christian or you believe in God, why is there so much sin and suffering in the world? Didn't Jesus come to die to end that? This is not a new question. This question's been around for a long time. So let's have a look in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. 
This is the fifth seal. And it says, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for their testimony, which they hurled. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O God, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Here's that question. We have suffered, God, for you. We have suffered for the word of God. Their lives testified of who they believed in, and they were put to death. Jesus says, uh, then it goes on to say, Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they must rest a little while longer until both the number of the fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was complete. They are given a white robe. Their salvation has been assured. But they're not in heaven. They're told to rest a little bit longer. The question was, how long, O oh God, true and holy, until you judge and avenge our blood? That's the question we're going to try and answer. How long, O oh God? So this brings us to Revelation 10, verse 7. And I'm going to read it a little bit different. It says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the plan of salvation found in Jesus Christ will be finished. That's what John's being told. The plan of salvation will be finished. When is the, seven trump the sound of the seventh trumpet? Now, if we're all good Bible students, we should know, it says over in chapter 11, verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. The seventh trumpet is the return of Christ. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of God. So just before the return of God, the plan of salvation is going to be ended. Now if we read on in, uh, in Revelation 10, John's told he needs to take this little book, which is open in the angel's hand, and eat it. Verse 8 says, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it, take and eat it. It will, be, it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten... My stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues and kings. What does it mean to be sweet in your mouth but bitter in your stomach? John's been told that the plan of salvation will be ended. But before it's ended... He needs to take this little book and consume it, eat it. I have a bad habit of writing notes and not following them. <laughs> it's quite difficult to get up here and preach, and I honestly don't feel like a preacher. So to eat something... It becomes part of you. You consume it and it becomes part of your body. John's being told that he must consume this word, this little book, eat it, study it, live it, know what it is. 
This book, or the Holy Bible, it points us to Jesus Christ. That is the central theme of the Bible and his plan of salvation. He wants to end sin for all of eternity. When we read this book, when we study it and we understand that, what a sweet message we have. We have a message to tell the world that this suffering and sin will not continue forever and ever. In my studies, I had a look at the fifth seal and we read from the fifth seal and the souls from under the altar. That time period was the Middle Ages. During that time, it is conservatively estimated that 50 million Christians were slaughtered for the word of God. They were declared to be heretics because they didn't go along with the orthodox religion of that day. Some were burnt at the stake, some were buried alive, pulled in pieces, I mean, the torture was horrific. We are in a battle between good and evil. Satan hates the word of God and he hates anyone that stands firm upon it. But Jesus has won that battle. He won it at the cross but he hasn't finished the battle. So we're to consume this word of God, we're to know what it says, we're to understand it, and we're told to preach it. When we understand that me, a sinner, can confess my sins before God and he is faithful and just to forgive me, that is a message that we need to share with those around us. But unfortunately, it turns bitter in our stomach. Why does it turn bitter in our stomach? We all know that famous verse, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But John 3.19 says, This is the condemnation. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Not everyone is going to accept the message of the scriptures. Not everyone believes in a God that saves us. We're going to be ridiculed, laughed at and scorned when we preach this message of salvation. And that's bitter. All of us would know people that have either been in the truth and walked away or don't know the truth and don't want to know it. And if that's a loved one, that isn't a good feeling. That causes pain in your stomach, that bitterness that John has been told about here. Jesus died for the whole world. The whole world does not live and accept Jesus. There's a very scary verse in Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6. So 
so I'm going to have to find that myself. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6. It says, My people, who are God's people? This is the Old Testament. I mean, we say God's people was Israel. But John 3, 16, Jesus died for the whole world. He wants the whole world to be his people. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they have rejected knowledge, I also will reject them. I also will reject you from being priests and uh, from being priests for me, because you have forgotten the law of God. I will also forget your children. We need to consume the word of God. That's where our knowledge comes from. How can we preach to the dying world something we do not know? The emphasis, I think, of Revelation chapter 10 is this eating the word, eating the little book and preaching. It's not necessarily an easy message because of the bitterness that we're going to face the bitterness we're going to feel when people reject you, reject the message of Christ. But it's something that John has been emphasised here in the book. Now, there was a time when I was not in the church. I had walked away. But the word of God, when we consume it and when we eat it, it has power to change us. I had no power within myself to change. But the more I read, the more I studied, the more I associated with this church, the more God changed me. Now the mystery of God will be finished just before the sounding of the seventh trumpet, just before God comes back. In John 14, 6, if you turn there, Jesus says, John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to me except through the Father. And in Psalm 77, 13, it says, Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great? A God as our God. Jesus has revealed, or God has revealed to us in his Bible, his plan of salvation. His plan of salvation is seen through the sanctuary. That great gospel message that we have to take to the world, the good news of Jesus Christ, is not a new message. It is a message that was given to the Israelites of old in the sanctuary. Unfortunately, they failed to see it. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. There is one way to the Father. That is through God. There was one way into the sanctuary. And that was through the gate or the door, which represented Jesus. His truth are found in the sanctuary. Every item in the sanctuary on earth, which was a replica of that in heaven, has a truth for us to learn and to study. Wow. 
Jesus Christ came to be that salvation. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now in Daniel chapter 8, we had a 70-week prophecy, or Daniel chapter 9. And that prophecy pointed to Jesus Christ, his death, the exact time of his anointing, his baptism, when he would die. But that prophecy was only part that prophecy was only the first portion of a larger prophecy, the two thousand three hundred year prophecy. That prophecy talks about the sanctuary being cleansed. Now in the first sermon that I wrote I was going to go into all the dates and the details of the 2300 days, the 70 week prophecy and what it all meant. It is so in depth and so big that you need to study that for yourself because there are some truths in that that will be sweet in your mouth. Study those prophecies, learn what they mean. Study the sanctuary of God. See what God is telling us through the sanctuary. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Acts 17, verse 31 says, Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he had ordained. He has given assurance of this to us all by him raising from the dead. Just like there was a time when Jesus was to come into the world, which was appointed, there is also a time appointed for judgment. Second Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may give the things done in the body. Sorry. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or to bad. Jesus is going to judge because the judgment is the final act in ending sin for eternity. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. It says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, which the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, entered the most holy place, once for all, having ordained eternal redemption, having attained eternal redemption. Christ is in the sanctuary in heaven with his blood. He was the perfect sacrifice. When we confess our sins, our sins are transferred to his blood and he takes that into the sanctuary. And there is coming a day when the sanctuary will be cleansed. If our sins are not in the sanctuary, they cannot be cleansed. But if we confess and give them to him, he will cleanse our sins so they will be never remembered. Our greatest need for this time is to eat God's word. I truly believe that we are living at the end just before that trumpet is going to be sounded. But we still have time to confess, to place our sins in heaven so that God can cleanse them. Acts 
Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. I think we all here today want our sins to be blotted out. None of us want to bear the burden or the price for our sins. And that's why we accept Jesus Christ, because he bore our sins for us. He has a work that he is doing. That work is through the sanctuary. And again, I challenge you to study the sanctuary. I want to finish with one of my favourite verses, or a few verses in the Bible. It's Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to 16. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. I've experienced that. I'm not perfect. Far from it. I still stumble and fall. But it is because of the word of God that my life has changed. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature on earth, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. God sees it all. He knows our heart. He knows what we're thinking. Verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Hold on to Jesus Christ. That's what the souls under the altar did in the Middle Ages. A lot of them didn't have the truth we have today. But they died for the truth that they had. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses. Jesus, the God, creator of the universe, became a man. He understands us. He knows our weaknesses and he is pleading on our behalf. But was in all things, all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And here's an incredible verse. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of trouble. We all need that grace of God. We are saved not by what we do. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. That grace comes when we believe in what Christ has done for us. And that will lead us to want that sweet experience to share our experience with those around us. So that was my thoughts on Revelation chapter 10. I hope I did it justice. And again, I challenge you to dig deep into that Chapter 10 is a beautiful, incredible chapter that has a lot of truth. Study it, read the word of God, and fortify yourself with him. Thank you. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you that we are going home in a little while. You have come and died for our sins, Lord, and you are working on our behalf to end sin for eternity. Lord, help us to fortify our minds with the word of God. Help us to internalise it, to learn the truths that you have for us so that we may go and preach to those that do not know. And Lord, bring them to your kingdom so they can go home with us also. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.